thank you all for taking the time to come out this morning and be able to look at your operations and be able to reflect back over the last season and see what worked, what didn't work. What are some of the specific challenges that are your operation? And they're going to be unique. The neighbor across the table, they're going to have a different set of challenges most likely. So as we work through some of the different challenges we've seen, keep in mind and filter that through your operation. There's going to be a fair bit of stuff that may not apply to you. Um, but um, just kind of think through that and, and hold on to those things which, which uh, will help your operation allow you to move forward. So we've got Stacy here from Precision as a regional manager. She'll be presenting most of the conversation today and all. And if you have any questions throughout it, certainly speak up and we'll do our best to get you the answers that you need. So Stacy. All right. So before we get started, can you guys hear me in the back? I want to make sure if I'm going to talk to you for a while, you can hear me. Just barely? <laughs> okay. I'll just yell at you the whole time. <laughs> All right. Um, how many of you guys in the past have been to an event that we've been at? A precision planting event? Show of hands real quick. Okay, good. Good. And how many of you guys were at our plot day last summer that we had here in Delhart? Okay, good. Almost half. Perfect. All right, so as Hans mentioned, I'm the Southwest Regional Manager of Precision Planning, so I have Texas, Kansas, Colorado, out to California. So a uh, big territory, we cover a lot of different variables, obviously, that we encounter um, with our equipment, and that's a value, obviously, you know, to probing Hans as well, to localize it to what you guys might run into in specific crops and planner making models. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started, and as Hans mentioned, as you guys have questions throughout the presentation, I mean, feel free to raise your hand and, and stop me and we can go through whatever you guys need for the, for, uh, further clarification on. So with that, as a company, we always say <laughs> a grower has one chance to get it right, period. So the minute that seed leaves your seed tube, regardless of the crop you're planting, there is nothing you can do as an operator to increase the maximum yield potential of that seed. Would you guys agree? Okay, so at that point as a farmer, you become a risk manager and you're gonna spend the rest of the entire season trying to retain as much of that yield potential as you can. So we have to ensure that the planter pass is controlled as much as we can and we limit the issues with variability throughout the field. So I actually uh, pulled this video, it's from a couple years ago, it's from the, the National um, College Football Championship down in Florida, and this guy got pulled from the audience. So he went to the game and they pulled one, one poor soul from the audience and they said, hey, we're going to give you a million bucks and we're going to give you one football. If you can hit this target with your football, you know, we'll grant you the million dollars. Today you'll go home with that money. But they only gave him one shot. So I always think that this guy is kind of like Joe the farmer, right? You go out to the field, you got one shot to get your planter pass right. And we know that in a lot of your scenarios, you know, the million dollar mark is where from that point on, you start to hit your, your profit margin, right? So it's, it's kind of uh, similar in that respect. So I'll play this video and let you guys watch it a couple times. So, just to give you an idea, the two was not his target. <laughs> so he had one shot for a million bucks and he totally missed it. So I had a clinic a couple days ago, or it was actually last week, but over in Groover, and this guy stood up and he was like, can you imagine if you went home to your wife or your girlfriend and you were like, hey, sorry I ditched you today, I went to a football game, I got a shot to win a million bucks, but I didn't hit my target. <laughs> it's not gonna go well, right? So we know it's critical that you have the tools to do the best job that you can. And we feel, because you guys are here today, that you're gonna gain some of those tools. So when you go out to the field, do you cross your fingers and just hope to heck you get it right? Or do you actually have information in the cab while you're planting to truly know whether or not the planter pass is performing the way that it's intended? So what's the overall goal of the planter pass? Seed depth is one. Anyone else? Spacing. Anything else? Okay, so the number one goal, I would say, of the perfect planter pass is uniformity across all plants. Okay? And when we look at uniformity, it comes down to, as you said, seed depth, so uniform emergence, uniform plant density, 
uniform access to food, and then you have to have the information in the cab to visually know that you're getting the uniformity out in the field. So this is a, a plant stand check that we pulled for a couple specific reasons, and we're gonna kinda look through this stand. So as you guys, it's kinda hard to see in the back, um, but this should probably be the easiest question I ask you all day, but how many ears should there be? So I'll give you options, nine, 10, or 11. 10? What about in the front? Can you see any better? So raise your hand if you think it's nine. Okay, what about 10? Okay, what about 11? <laughs> okay, it's a little hard to see in the back, but there should be 11 stalks, right, up here. There's actually one right here, but these lights are probably blinding us. But with 11 stalks, you should have 11 good, healthy, uniform ears, but we don't. Okay, so now we have to start to look at the stand and, and figure out why. Well, we can quickly see that all of our plants are not where they should be. So spacing is obviously an issue. And when you're out walking your cornfield, if you're a corn farmer, every time you see a small spindly stalk, you automatically know that's a late emerger. Okay? So we have spacing issues and issues with late emergence. So when could we have known that this was an issue? In the cab, right? While you're planting. So we have to have the information in the cab so we can fix it. And how much did it cost us? So if we had had 11 perfect ears like these two, then we would have had about 250 bushel in potential. But we didn't. We had nine and a half, right? So in this stand, nine and a half good ears only left us with 216 bushel an acre. So the only reason I'm showing you this, because I know you guys are all looking at me like, we've seen stands like this, why are you talking through this? Is that I've realized over the last six years that you jump, and I jump in a lot of combine cabs, okay? And I talk to a lot of farmers, and oftentimes they say, well, this year I got 250 bushel corn. I did really well, correct. But in the combine, you have one monitor that gives you one metric, and that's an average across your header. So do you truly know as a grower where your variability is in your stand? And if you don't, we have to give you the information to, to be able to better scout your fields when it comes to the planter pass. So on average, we've looked at thousands of acres, and what we have found is whether it's a brand new planter out of the factory or it's a used planter, the national average for ear count potential is at about 90%. So we're leaving about 10% of our yield in the field, right, from having issues from the planter pass in a lot of scenarios. So what are the priorities of the planter pass when it comes to the yield pyramid? The first is obviously emergence because we got to get the crop out of the ground, and then we can worry about the other metrics across the planter. So this is actually a picture <laughs> from a guy from the Midwest, and this grower put our Air Force system on a couple years ago, so that means that we're taking control of his airbags and controlling his weight throughout the field, essentially. And he put this system on, and he called the regional manager in the Midwest, and he said, hey, this stand is not better than what it has been before I put your product on. It's like, we got a problem because I paid for your product. <laughs> well, he still had his tractor, this little tractor was designated to that planter and he still had it hooked up. So he pulled the planter out from behind the shop and you can instantly see that we have a problem. He's not hitched where he should be hitched, okay? In this scenario, everything on the back of this planter is not gonna interact with the soil the way that it's designed to. So your closing system's not gonna close correctly, your opening discs are not gonna you know, penetrate the soil to the depth that you're looking for, and you're going to have issues. So the planter hitch is, is too low, the seven by seven bar is running downhill, and we all know that you need to be hitched high for maximum performance. So the reason that we're gonna talk through a lot of maintenance right now in December, right before Christmas, <laughs> it's not that I think you guys are gonna go home and pull your planters out. I realize that you're probably not gonna do this until beginning of the year, if, you know, if not right before planting, but if we don't get the maintenance right, then we can control only to the wrong variables. So this is always step one. So this is actually a field view map, and this is a, a grower in, um, around Aberdeen, South Dakota. And this specific grower had a big CCS planter. So who in here has a CCS planter? Anyone? Show of hands real quick. Okay. So on these big CCS planters, 
He went out to the field and he started planting and on this field view map, those blue areas mean loss of ground contact, okay? So essentially what that means is he's not hitting his mechanical depth stop. So as he's going through the field, areas of that planter are essentially floating. They're not hitting the depth stop. So his CCS fan was turning on and off, his row cleaners weren't spinning, and his system was saying planter lifted, not planting. So in this scenario, what do you think happened? Big CCS planter. I'm already getting the, okay, if I don't look directly at her, she's not gonna ask me a specific, <laughs> specific look from you guys. What do you guys think happened on this big CCS planter? Anyone? He filled up the seed tank? Okay. Anyone else? Tool bar wasn't level? It wasn't level, you're right. Um, so I'll give you a hat just for saying something. You're right, it wasn't level. In this scenario, what actually happened is you can see here his parallel arms aren't parallel, but it's only because on these big CCS planters, there's these main hydraulic lift cylinders and there's two pinouts, and one of those pinouts is for no-till, and the other one's for conventional till. So if you're a guy going out to plant into no-till conditions, like this guy was, but he's pinned out right here for conventional till, his planter is not gonna settle the way that it needs to when it pulls into the field. So the dealer got out there, pinned him out correctly under those lift cylinders, and then from there, they put 1,000 pounds on each wing, and then when he went back out to the field, as you said, his planter bar was where it should be at that point. It's 20 to 22 inches from the ground level, and then his parallel arms actually settled out, and it engaged the way that it should have on that specific planter. So just another mechanical issue, but same scenario here. This guy put our equipment on, he expected it to work, and it wasn't going to because he wasn't pinned out correctly. Simple solution, we just have to make sure we're looking for it. Did you want to touch on planter bars? So on your CCS planters, the, there's not a lot of control you have over maintaining levelness from side to side. Do make sure your tires are the same as what the factory called for, um, especially on some of those used ones. Keep an eye on that. And then on your three-point planters, and those are the ones we've got to be very careful of because you have those adjustment bolts on the gauge wheels and taking the time before the season and making sure we have the even amount of thread showing on all four tires or more depending upon what you have on there in order to ensure that we're not running those parallel arms other than level across that machine. Okay. So another thing to look toward, especially on deer planters, when it comes to bushings and bolts, we always say if you can get behind your row unit and move that row unit to the side to side or up and down more than a quarter of an inch, there's too much slop. So if your row unit moves, what else is gonna move in your planting? Your seed, right? So we gotta make sure that, that we're changing these out when we need to. Oftentimes, we've got a lot of growers now that go to, to more of a shoulder bolt and they make sure that they're not threaded um, and they t you know, reduce some of that wear in some of those areas. Yeah, and so what ends up happening is deer was kind enough to harden the bushings, but they left the arms soft. So we end up egging the arm out and there's no benefit to replacing the bushing. So we found an outfit that can actually go in, we mill out those arms and pressed in a two-part hardened on hardened bushing. So we'll be able to run 10 plus years without having to worry about slop developing back into those parallel arms. Okay, so the first area of the planter that's essentially interacting with the soil is obviously the row cleaners. I mean, the intention is to clear a clean uh, path before the, the opening disc. So why residue management? The first area is obviously temperature. So when we go out to plant, we all know if you have a heavy matter residue, there's gonna be a different temperature under that area than in a, you know, an area of the soil that's bare and the sunlight is hitting that area. Moisture becomes an issue. Residue is gonna wick moisture away from that seed. Disease potential, we all know that residue harbors you know, disease. You run the risk of, of seedling blight and so forth. And then residue also immobilizes nutrients. So we have to do our best to ensure that we're getting, whether it's cotton, corn, beans, whatever it may be, all that residue out of the way of the furrow. So as a company, we always say, always floating cleaners, never fixed. What happens to a fixed row cleaner? Let's say you're planning on terracing, or you come up to a berm or a big clod. What do the row cleaners do? 
They bulldoze it out, right? So essentially, they're going to move the intent. They're going to move all of your your residue that's helping your environment. And they're going to bulldoze it out, and you're going to put that seed into a mucky environment. So we have to make sure that we're running those row cleaners, and we don't have um, a pinned fixed row cleaner. I've had a lot of guys in Kansas in the heat of planting that tell me, you know, if they're running shark tooth row cleaners, they get done with the row cleaners, trying to pin them up, and they look like they've been in a knife fight because those row cleaners are just tearing up their hands. So we have a good solution to try and alleviate some issues um, and bring the control to the cab. And we want to make sure when we have that control in the cab that we have the correct row cleaner on the planter itself. So, so what we've seen is the, the Yetter shark tooth or any, any shark tooth type format of a row cleaner, it's going to move everything it touches. And looking back and walking a number of fields over the last couple of years, we're seeing a lot of furrowing and we're generating an inconsistent depth as well as uh, a poor ride of that row unit. The um, Martin spoke row cleaners or Yetter has an equivalent on that. We're able to sift that residue back and not move the dirt. So we're able to leave a much more uniform environment so that that row unit runs smoother. So our solution in the cab, and I would say this is probably one of the first products a lot of growers you know, apply to their planter in areas where you're in no-till and heavy residue like we are um, in some scenarios around here, is clean sweep. So clean sweep essentially is a little control box in the cab, and as you're going through the field, you now have the ability, if you get to an area where you have too much residue and you don't feel like you're cleaning enough, you can actually apply weight um, via air to your row cleaners on a system-wide basis and clean away the residue. And if you get to an area where you have maybe a more, you know, there's an area of your field that's too wet, you can actually relieve the weight off of the row cleaners and lift them up if you need to in some of those areas as well. So the next area that we look at on the actual planner itself is establishing the trench. So essentially depth control. So we, we know we run the risk of creating a W bottom when you have worn opening discs. With this W bottom, the seed has the opportunity to fall anywhere within that trench. So not only will you have uneven moisture, but you're gonna have uneven depth control as well. So we really have to make sure we do our maintenance on our discs. So how many of you guys in the past have actually done the business card test? I'm sure a lot. Okay, so almost all of you. So for those that haven't, all you're simply doing is taking a business card, you're going from the back to the front, from the back to the front, you're gonna make two marks, and you're measuring the contact point in between. So you wanna make sure, depending upon the size of your blades, that you have enough contact of those blades so you don't get that W bottom. When it comes to opening discs, if you have a 14, or if, I'm sorry, if you have a 15 inch opening disc, you need to replace them at 14 and a half inches. So depending upon the size of your disc that you're starting with, if you're a case, and you're at 14 inches, you replace them at 13 and a half. So we really need to make sure that we're replacing them when they get worn. A lot of guys know they're gonna plant, you know, two, 3,000 acres. If you're already wearing your discs, I mean, you know they're gonna, they're gonna get fully worn in the middle of season, you're gonna have issues in your, your depth or your, your trench control. So make sure you're changing these out. Um, there was actually a guy a couple years ago from South Dakota that he had a deer planter and he was changing out his opening discs behind his shop and his neighbor had left to go to town to go see the banker. And he's driving to town, he saw his neighbor changing out his discs, so he pulled in and he said, you know, what are you doing? And the guy said, well, my opening discs are too small. They got down to 14 and a half inches. So the guy going to town said, well, mine are 14 inches. Can I take yours and take them home and put them on my planter? <laughs> so, so later on, the, the regional manager in South Dakota went and asked that guy, he's like, why would you give him your opening disc, you knew they were too small. And he said, well, I never liked them anyways. So we thought, well, if you, <laughs> if you don't like your neighbors, that is definitely a way to get them, <laughs> is to give them your opening disc that are too small. So make sure you're, you're at the correct size. Okay, checking for depth settings on specifically a deer planner. Um, quick show of hands, who in here has a John Deere planner? Okay, who has a case? Okay, what about white? Okay, monosim, anyone have a monosim? Okay, okay. So specifically on a deer planter, because I've seen this multiple times, um, make sure when you're, you're looking at your depth and you're trying to set your depth out in the field that, that you truly know how deep that planter is going to plant. And this is very critical, and I'll show you a slide in a second on how to set this. But every single notch is a quarter of an inch. 
So I will say this, if you're a guy that goes to our weight management control, okay, and in the past you used to set your planner at three inches to achieve two inches, okay? Some guys set their planners at three inches because they got a lot of wear across their planners and that truly gets them to two inches in depth. If you put our weight control system on, we need to control against the correct variables, right? So one thing you can do is essentially zero out your planner. It won't take you, but how long, Hans? Maybe an hour in the shop? Okay, so take your planner into the shop. We want you to set your gauge wheels on two inches of block, okay? And then you're gonna set your discs or your depth settings for two inches. And what you're looking for is you're trying to determine on every single row of that planner, when you set your depth for two inches, are you actually hitting that cement surface? Because if you have two inches of block, that should get you to the cement. But we know planners, whether it's new or used, there's variability in some scenarios. Planner row units wear differently because of the weight applied to them. So I've had a lot of guys that do this test and they try and put little fender washers under here and they're trying to see what is actually the distance and that gap between the disc openers and the cement. And then what you do is you essentially go through and you're gonna mark on that row unit what truly gets you to two inches on each of those rows. And the reason you're doing this is because if you go out as a grower and you think you're gonna plant two inches, but this distance is not the same on every row, you are not gonna plant uniformly across that planter. So if you have that marked and you know where your true two is and you go out to the field and you're searching for moisture and you wanna to go to two and a quarter or two and a half, you know you're already calibrated as to where the true two is and you can from there adjust your depth settings. So, I mean, you've probably done it in the past too, but this is something that I think is extremely critical when it comes to to depth management. Yeah, so depending upon what you're wanting your target depth to be, say if you're that inch and three quarter, you would come up with about two inches worth of block and kick it under your tires, run the depth handle up until it stops. And that's where we're able to set it for that. And then for the cotton guys, depending upon what you're wanting to go for depth, if you're wanting to go for three quarter, you'd go in and come up with about a one inch block and then run the handle up until it stops. Um, Bryce, you guys went and did that on the cotton machine. How much variability did you end up seeing? And then kind of what was the effect on stand? And then what, what was the effect on this cotton stand after you went through and calibrated that depth? I mean, there's a lot of things you can do like this that could improve your yield for the next year that cost you nothing that, like you said, I mean, it helps you get the true depth on every row. So this, I actually created a step-by-step -step that once you guys fill out those cards on your tables, um, if you put your email, I can have Hans email it out because I know you're probably not going to remember this come February <laughs> when you go to do your maintenance, but we can send it out to you. So we know weight management is critical, and this is an area that, that we're gonna start to look into and, and speak through. So why the necessity of weight management? The soil structure determines the amount of water and oxygen that's held in the soil profile that influences the microbial activity. So soils that are compacted reduce the soil particle size and they collapse that soil particle and they take it from a macro to a micro. So I wanna say this, who in the past has ever planted into maybe too wet of a condition? <laughs> okay, I thought if I threw the word maybe in there, someone might raise their hand. <laughs> okay, if you plant into too wet of a condition and you take your planter and you go out into the field and you're compacting, okay? When those gauge wheels smear the sidewall and you compact, what happens is you're shrinking that pore size of the soil. Well, the issue with that is when that little young plant, let's say in corn, is at V4 to V6, and you're setting the maximum potential of that plant, you're gonna stress that plant. And that plant is gonna have to shrink its actual root size to a smaller size to get through those pores. Well, those roots are your chassis for the entire season that are bringing, you know, bringing up the water and nutrients into the plant. And if you stress it and you shrink your chassis, are you gonna have the maximum performance of that plant? No, no, right? So we have to make sure that we do not shrink the pore size around the furrow. As I said, it creates an adverse environment for root growth and nutrient uptake. And the other thing to think through as well, if any of you guys are doing a two by two out in your fields, I don't know how many of you guys are, but if you do and you compact that environment, 
that root system is not going to grow into where your two by two has been placed because it's going to grow straight down. You don't actually get the value of your fertility application because the roots can't actually reach out to it. So weight management on the planter is extremely important for all those reasons. Do you want to touch on anything? Yeah, so an another thing is the majority of us are on and off sand a fair bit with a few occasional spots of clay and we have found even around, around Munker Hill, we can generate hatchet roots with, I think we was running maybe 175 pounds of extra weight on the gauge wheel. So it does not take much to be able to shut those plants down and just need to be observant and understand what, what the variability that we're dealing with and how much clay is on an operation. Okay, so when we look at the actual row unit, there are, you know, there are forces pushing against the row unit and there are forces pushing, you know, on the row unit and against the row unit. So essentially, when it comes to weight, you have to have more weight being applied to the row unit than the forces pushing against it, because if you don't, you're going to float that planter. So your seed boxes, if you're running insecticide, the actual springs or airbags, and then the weight of the planter itself are all components keeping your row unit in the ground. And then your closing system, your opening discs, and your row cleaners are all forces that are trying to push that row unit out of the ground. So what happens when you pull that planter into the field? When speed becomes a factor, what happens to your planter? Runs up, right? So in that scenario, all the force, all the force variability changes. So this is actually a picture of a guy that has three bushel boxes. And as I said before, in this specific map, Blue means they lost ground contact, they didn't hit their mechanical depth stop. Red means they have too much weight. So the guy with the three bushel box, he pulls up to the field, you guys know you have to get to depth, so you just pile the weight on, okay? Because you're gonna, you're gonna try and get to the depth. So you have too much weight and all of your seeds in your boxes and you compact. Then as you start to plant, all that seed is now planted into the soil, it's not holding your planter down and you float that planter. Guy comes back out with the tender, you fill back up, you're too heavy, and the same thing happens again. So if you have a three bushel box or a 1.6 bushel box, this variability in weight is happening throughout every field you plant. And we have to see it and be able to control against it. So this is a, the opposite of that map. This is actually, I pulled this from Copeland, Kansas. I don't know if you guys know where that's at, but um, this grower has Delta Force, which we'll talk through in a bit but essentially every row, we're controlling his weight management. He also has three bushel boxes. So on this specific map, we're showing how much weight did our planter apply or relieve from those row units. So he goes out to the field, blue on this map means we're taking off weight. So three bushel box, he's completely full right here. We're removing the weight. As that guy starts to plant, he gets toward the edge, he's planted out a seed, we apply weight. Same thing on this side, he comes back out, he starts near the center of the pivot, he has too much weight, we take it off. As he plants toward the edge of the field, we have to apply weight to keep him to the depth that he's, he's shooting for. So when you're too light, we know you run the risk of you know, shallow planting out in the field. And when you're too heavy, you know, as we spoke to before, you can smear that sidewall and over compact on that planter. So when you're too heavy, which most guys I would say in a lot of scenarios have more weight than less if they have you know, just side springs or, or static bags because they know they have to get to depth so they pile on too much weight. So you run the risk of slotting and then obviously, as Hans mentioned, you can get hatchet roots as well. In cotton, it is even that much more important to have depth control. Because when you guys are planting cotton, how deep are you planting? An inch, maybe three quarters of an inch. So if you miss your mark on cotton, it hurts worse because if you're a quarter of an inch off on cotton or you plant too deep, you don't have the vigor to break the crust or whatever it may be to get that seed to germ correctly. So weight management is extremely key. And, and in cotton, you know, with too much weight, oftentimes a lot of guys big shank, or you can see here, this is 300 pounds of extra weight. And in that scenario, they had complete uneven emergence with cotton. So this is another good visual, but we've seen a lot of fields like this with CCS planters, and um, a lot of guys with CCS planters in the past have walked out to their fields. Have you guys ever seen your fields wave? Okay, 
In this specific scenario, this is directly related to pinch rows on that planner. So this bothered us for years, and so finally a couple years ago we took it to yield to see, okay, every single row, whether it's pinched or not, what would that row have yielded? So what you can see here is row 15 is pinched. 132 bushel is what it would have yielded. Row 13 that's not pinched at all, you can look at the ear size here, it would have been 262 bushel. So it's over 100 bushel difference from a row that is not pinched versus a row that's pinched. So across my territory, I can't tell you how many guys have come up to me after a clinic and said, but that's only a few rows on my planner. <laughs> a few pinch rows, which is correct, but it's a few pinch rows on your planner across every single field that you plant in your entire operation. How much money are you leaving on the table by not controlling the pinch row environment? So how do you manage downforce? We know you have to have enough weight so you can get to depth, but you can't have too much because then you're going to compact. So the first area that we look, as, look at as a company is in relation to ground contact, as we mentioned before. So ground contact just simply means the percentage of time the gauge wheel arms are pushing against that mechanical depth stop, okay? If we're push, pushing against the depth stop and you said I want to plant two inches, we can confidently say, okay, we've got weight, we're pushing against the depth stop based on our load sensor and we know that we're at the depth that you at least set mechanically on that planter. If we don't hit that depth stop, we're going to shallow plant seed and then we know that we're limiting the ability for good healthy root growth. So when you lose ground contact out in the field, you will have emergence issues. And a lot of what we found in corn in specific is when you have a plant that's one leaf collar behind its neighbors, it's usually a 10 to 50% loss, okay? If you have a plant that's two leaf collars behind its neighbor, it's a weed. You're probably not going to get anything out of it. So on the flip side, if you overcompact in that environment, as I mentioned before, when you're setting your rows around, you run the risk of losing two rows around by stressing that plant in that V4 to v V6 time frame. So you're going to set a smaller ear in that environment. So this is a quick step-by-step, -step, but I highly suggest you guys do this next year. I'm sure you can find someone that has a yellow or red solo cup. Take it out to the field, take a flag, mark one plant that's two leaf collars behind. Okay, it'll take you five minutes. And you're going to follow it through the year. So on this side, this is actually in May. And on this side, this is actually in August. But you can see here that one plant that we followed has a small spindly stalk. Okay, it's a later merger. So a lot of guys walk their, their crops, and like I said before, we have to make sure that we're looking for issues related to the planter. In this scenario, a lot of guys would look at this and they would think, at least I got an ear. You got something. But when you take it to harvest, you realize you really got nothing in return. Okay? It emerged late, the insects probably clipped its silk, and you had no grain fill. So the issue with this is you as a grower spent the same amount of investments in this year as you did these, but it gave you nothing back. So how much of your crop have you lost that ear potential that we discussed at the intro? So who, and some of you guys have been to some of our presentations in the past, so hopefully someone remembers, but who remembers how to truly determine how deep you've planted that crop after planting? Like, let's assume you go out at V6, or you go out the day the combine's running through the field. How do you know how deep you actually planted? You got three, you're, I think you're the first person in about seven meetings I've had in the last few weeks. <laughs> oh, there you go. You have cheat sheet notes. <laughs> you're right. At least you're reading, huh? Okay, so to know your true planting depth, you essentially go out and dig up a plant, and you're going to measure from the bottom of this crown to where your seed is. That's your mesocotyl. And you're going to add three quarters of an inch. So the reason for this is the seed is going, you're going to plant the seed, it's going to germ, it stops three quarters of an inch from the soil surface when it senses the sunlight. The only reason this is important is if you as a grower thought, you know, last year I think I planted too deep in some areas of my field, or maybe I thought my wings were floating throughout portions of the field, 
go prove it to yourself and get out there and dig and see how deep you actually planted. Do you want to mention something? So on, now if we flip this conversation over to cotton, we can't necessarily dig up a cotton plant yet and know exactly where to go on that, but we have backed up and looked at, guys have had the hypothesis that with cotton, if a plant comes up late or if there's a skip, the plant is going to compensate. So we got some interns together this year, we went and hand harvested about 400 plants to start a data set, to start understanding what is going on. What we're seeing is spacing costs us the least amount of yield loss. A multiple, gonna cost us a bit more. Skips do cost us a fair bit. If all the plants are of the same height, we're looking at somewhere around about a 10 to 15% loss over optimum if the height's right. Now, if that plant is shorter than the others, we can end up with about a 30 to 40% loss in yield for those plants that are a little bit shorter, and then there's a gap between them and their neighbors. So with time, we'll continue to expand this data set so we can get more solid numbers to corn, but do not think that there's not a yield loss. There is a yield loss, and we're looking somewhere around 30% is a good starting point for each plant that's missing in the field. Okay, so when we look at weight management, we say a lot of growers today have planter-wide control. So what happens is a lot of growers pull up to a field, you set your depth settings, you guys all get back there and fight over who's correct on how deep you're actually planting and whether or not you're at the right spot, and then you just go and plant. So if you're someone that today, let's say, has a side spring or a spring or a static airbag, okay, and you set your depth or you set your active, you know, or your static airbag, and you, let's say you put 80 PSI on that planter, and you dig at the edge of the field and you say, we're good, let's go plant. How do you know in the middle of that field that that 80 PSI or that side spring is actually getting you to the depth that you're trying to achieve? You don't know, right? Because what was good at the beginning of the field, when your weight variables and everything, your soil, your soils change and so forth, in the middle of the field, you truly don't know whether or not you're at the correct depth. So we say that's planter-wide control. So the first solution we had on the market was Air Force. So a lot of you guys have probably heard of Air Force. Did anyone run Air Force in this room? Okay, so Air Force essentially, we're taking control of your airbags if you currently have them. We're gonna add uplift bags on that system. If you have side springs, we'll add both down and uplift bag. But essentially, we're going through the field with the hydraulic compressor and we're saying, okay, every second, do we have the correct amount of weight, planner wide, or do we need more? Or are we compacting and we actually need less? And every second, that system's gonna make a change to try and achieve the correct weight environment, planner wide, um, across that planner in that field. So Air Force is a great product, but air can only react so fast. So this is actually a picture of, of a field, another field from the Midwest, and this guy told his son, and maybe this has happened to you in the past too, but he said, hey, go out to, go out to our fields and till at a slight angle, just a slight angle. And so his son, who was in high school, went out and tilled at what he thought was a slight angle throughout his field, right? Well, the issue is this guy has Air Force on his planter, so Air Force goes out to the field and we're trying to ensure that that guy keeps ground contact. And the only thing we can do when that planter is popping up over those tillage tracks throughout the field is hammer the weight to it. So we're gonna hammer the weight to it to try and keep that planter in the ground. And you can see the entire field, we're almost applying too much weight across the majority of that field. So we know, in general, a planter requires a different amount of weight on a row unit that's underneath a CCS tank versus a row unit that's not pinched versus a row unit that's on a wing. So does anyone in here have a big, um, you know, 24-row planter or above that actually plants in circles? Okay, so in these environments, when you take that planter and you swing that planter, those outside rows are going faster than the inside rows, right? So the outside rows actually require more weight than those inside rows to keep those row units in the ground as you're planting in those, those circular environments. So the first solution that we came up with, and it's actually on this planter over here, um, you guys can come up at break, but we essentially created a hydraulic control system. So this is called Delta Force. 
and throughout the field, we're taking readings on every single row, and we're determining, okay, on this specific row, if I'm in a pinch row, do I need to apply more weight or less weight? Every single row is going to react to the environment and the weight variables on that specific row. So now when you go through a field, if you're a guy that ran a, a stripper or a combine or a side dress rig or, or a strip till rig, whatever it may be, if you ran that machine through your field last year, you have tracks in your field. So now when that planner is gonna go over those tracks that you created in your field, that planner is gonna pop up, okay? So Delta Force by design is going to help control the areas of the field when you're going over um, those tracks that you might have created. So this is a really good visual. I took this map from a grower in Nebraska, but I've heard a lot of guys that say, well, I strip till, so I have a mellow environment and weight management isn't an issue. So this is actually a guy that strip tilled with a 12 row strip till rig, but then he planted with a 24 row planter. Okay, so he matches up, but the left hand side on this specific pass of the planter is off the strip by two inches, two or three inches. Okay, that's it. And on the left hand side of the planter where he was off the strip, our system actually had to apply about 175, you know, to 200 plus pounds to get him to the depth he was shooting for because he wasn't on the strip. And on the right hand side of the planner, he was on the strip. And in this scenario, we actually had to lift up weight because he had a more mellow environment. So even in strip till environments, if your strip till rigs don't exactly match up to what your planner pass is doing, you will have a variability from one side of that planner to the next in the amount of weight that you require to get to the depth you need to be at. So this is another good picture, but this is actually a field um, with two completely different soil types. So the top was uh, no-till ground, and it took them, you know, you can see up to 500 pounds to get to the depth that they were shooting for. The bottom half of this field, they had to work because of the, the soil environment. So in the worked ground, it, you know, they're essentially lifting up to 60 pounds in that south side of the field. So it just goes to show you with one hydraulic control system, we're gonna control across the whole field regardless of the environment that we encounter. And this is another good visual. This is actually, I don't know if you guys know where Hillsboro, Texas is. I'm sure some of you do. But um, this is a, a grower we had down there. And he went out to the field and he had a 16 row side spring planter, okay? Then he had a 24 row delta planter. The 16 row side spring planter planted, you know, three fourths of that field, but then a rain came so we took that planter, you know, and the other planter out of the field and they went and parked it. Three days later, after the rain, the Delta Force planter came back out and finished up the field by accident. The operators went to the wrong field. Well, the technical agronomist at DeKalb called the grower out and he's like, I don't know what you did right here, but you need to come look at your field. So you can see here that they unintentionally got a side by side of their Delta versus their side spring. And the Delta Force planter was planted three days later and it's a full leaf collar ahead of that side spring planter. So it just goes to show you, if you have weight control and your goal is even quick emergence, that the weight control on every row is going to help you achieve that environment. You can see here the actual root system between the two, the delta versus the side spring. So in general, if you are manual or airbags, manual springs or airbags, about 50 to 65% of the field, you're at the correct weight management. If you have air force, it gets you to about 85%, but yet there again, it still can only react so fast. And then delta force in most fields is around that 98% that you will have the correct weight across that planter that you're shooting for. Hans, did you want to touch on anything else on delta? Okay. So the next area that we look at is, is um, firming the seed with the Keaton seed firmer and then sealing the trench correctly. So I used to think that <laughs> closing the furrow wasn't as hard as now I, I think it is after going out with Hans last year. So Hans had a, a um, demo planter that he was running with eight different closing systems on and we were planting into, what was it, cotton stubble out in that field. And Hans said, hey, get back there and look around on the back of that planter and try and figure out which one do you think is the best on that planter. So you'd get out there and you'd look around and you'd say, okay, it's row four. 
Then you pull forward five feet, and now it's row five. And then you pull forward again, you have different residue, and it just constantly changes. So who in here feels like they don't ever have 100% confidence that they're closing the furrow the way that they should be? OK, a good portion. So what we have found is weight on the closing system definitely matters. If you're too light, you can get air pockets in the actual furrow. And if you're too heavy, you can co collapse that furrow sidewall. So what we have found is in a lot of scenarios, if you use those John Deere cast closing systems, they add about an extra, what, 40 or so pounds. And the extra weight helps you close a better furrow. But it also comes down to your closing alignment. So if you happen to have this closing system, you need to measure from the center of one wheel to the center of the next, and this distance should be two and a half inches, OK? If you're too narrow, you get an air pocket below the seed. And if you're too wide, you get an air pocket above the seed. So that distance is critical. Do you want to touch on? Yeah, so of kind of looking back through the different closing systems we ran and, and analyzing all the plants from that, there's a different set of closing wheels that work best in full tillage, a different set in strip till, and no till and strip till happen to be fairly similar. Um, there was three that did do better. Um, we want to run a couple more years and get some more information there to make sure we're not recommending a purchase that's going to be wrong. And certainly on the closing wheel conversation, come to winter conference, there'll be a whole lot more conversation on closing systems. Yeah, we have winter conference invites at the back if you guys want to pick them up. <laughs> so be, be to the kind of the center of the same distance on the surface. So if you got, what, you're running the... Okay, um, basically kind of wherever the same original distance would have been on the, on the rubber wheel, that would be the distance we would end up using unless you're in cotton. Then we've got to be careful about we don't want to be lifting that seed out of the ground, so we may need to be a bit higher or a less aggressive closing system. So there's different things to be mindful of within different systems. Any other questions? So the next area that we look at is obviously uniform plant density. So directly related to singulation out in the field. How many of you guys in every single field that you plant <laughs> have the picket thing stand like this, whether it's cotton, corn, beans? Show of hands. I'm seeing some guys shake their heads over here. Anyone? <laughs> okay. I used to present in South Texas every year, and there's always this one grower that stood up, and he was like, that's my field. And his neighbor was in the, in the room, and every single year his neighbor's like, I've never seen one of your fields that looks like that. <laughs> so I realize that oftentimes you guys don't respond to the questions I ask, because you know there's other people around here, and you don't, you know, don't want to maybe say the wrong thing or whatever it may be, and, and that guy's a, a good scenario. <laughs> so oftentimes, this is what our fields look like, okay? In these scenarios, if any of you guys are, are struggling in areas where water management is an issue, Okay, you're having to control and limit your water application. We know when you don't have a good healthy crop canopy and the sunlight actually hits the soil surface, you can lose up to a quarter of an inch a day more in those areas where we're hitting the soil surface. So we have to ensure that you have a quick, healthy crop, crop canopy so that way we're not losing moisture out in the field, our limited moisture. So a little care goes a long way. This is actually a picture that we pulled off a planter right before planting season last year. And you can see that we have a slight issue here. <laughs> but this is what we run into. And I would highly suggest that every year you take your meters and bring them to your dealer and let Hans run them on the meter max. Um, and you can speak to you know, well, what you guys do. And do certainly meters, and what we've done here is you don't have to bring the meters in. We'll bring the test in to the farm and ensure that, that you guys are set up and ready to roll for that season. So a couple years ago, we came out with a product called VSET. And VSET was essentially our chance to create our own meter. So a lot of you guys might have E sets, which is a John Deere retrofit. That was essentially us trying to increase singulation with the current Deere metering system. So VSET was our chance to create, like I said, our own meter. You can see it's much, much smaller than what you guys might have ran with your, your John Deere meter housings. The smaller meter is a lot easier to, you know, turn on a drive system, takes less rolling torque on the, the meter itself. You can see with this meter, 
There's a much smaller vac chamber. There's a small C vac chamber, so there's less vac loss. Um, in specific, it has the same philosophy as an ESET. You're going to pour you know, as many seeds as you can into the housing. We're going to turn up the vacuum. And then we're going to let this five lobe singulator do all the work, like it does on the ESET. Okay? So every single lobe cuts off a different percentage of vacuum. By the time we get to the fifth lobe, that's essentially our insurance. So with a V-set, if you guys are in rough environments, okay, you got residue, you're bouncing around in the field. This specific meter by design, these bottom lobes help us keep that seed aligned on that cell. So between the vacuum and these bottom lobes, um, this floating singulator essentially molds with, with the disc and we can float and not shear seeds off of the disc when you are planting in those rough environments. So in addition to that, on the bottom, you can see this little knockout wheel. If you get a fine or a fragment and it comes along on the disc in a pass, we're going to knock it out so the next revolution you don't have an issue with your, your seed fragments in the actual um, disc itself. So I'll pass this around. The other thing that we've found with these ESET meters is Beans was able to redesign the principles of the ESET. The package that it's in, we're getting about three to four times the wear life out of parts versus the ESETs, and then those replacement parts cost a fair bit less than that. So we're, we're getting to the point where on a maintenance basis, we can almost pay to go to these meters over an ESET just over the long haul, but it depends upon where a guy's at and where he's going. So it'll, it'll fit on any box planters without retrofitting. We are limited on the deer CCS. When you have a pro shaft, you end up, there is an outfit that made a gearbox, same outfit that makes the gearbox for deer, made an adapter to this. The problem is it's over half the price of what it would cost to put V-Drive on. So it's not an economical route to go that way. So there is some other challenges on those CCS machines, but there are other economic advantages we'll get into in a little bit in certain situations. Yeah, and what Han says, I mean, there are challenges on a CCS. It's a challenge to put just the meter on. Um, we'll talk through it in a bit, but you can always put the meter on with the electric drive. And once you do that, it'll go on pretty much any make and model that's out in the industry. So. So this is a quick study that Chad Gallus did. He looked at 22,000 acres, and essentially they're trying to determine, you know, what's the increase in bushel uh, per percent of singulation. So as you can see here, there's a direct relationship to high singulation versus yield. And for every 1% increase in singulation, there's about a two bushel advantage in corn in specific. So the next area that we look at is in spacing. This is actually a guy that went out to the field all these red dots are skips. So we knew he had an issue, and when he got to this portion of the field, he stopped his planter and he realized one of his chains was worn. So he changed out his bad chain and his system got worse. So in this scenario, you can see here, the center of the field is actually much worse after he put a new chain on. Well, his old sprocket had worn and his new chain wasn't aligning with his old sprocket. So in that scenario, he didn't actually improve until he had changed out both his worn chain and his worn socket, and then his drive system improved from that point on in the field. So this is another issue with spacing. This is actually a guy, he called me two years ago in central Kansas, I think it was in August, and he said, hey, I am having a horrible time with my singulation on my planner. Can you come with me and come out and scout my fields? Well, in August in Kansas, it's really nice outside. So we went out and it was fairly miserable, but we crawled all along in his field and we were trying to figure out what the heck happened. And he kept thinking it was his meters. And I looked at his singulation on his field view and it wasn't his meters. He had 99% singulation. There's no way it's his meters. What happened was if you guys have any cable drive planners, this guy had a cable drive planner and his cable drive actually would bind up and then it would release, and then it would bind up, and then it would release. So in his field, when it would bind up, he would have a big gap. And then when it would release, he'd have plant, 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 plant. So the only reason I'm showing you this is to say, this grower was gonna go out and change out 24 of his meters, and this was never a meter issue, this was a drive system issue that was creating these spacing gaps in the field. So we have to make sure we know what we're looking at. So there are, there are areas on the row unit that become an issue um, with spacing at higher speeds. 
So the first area we look at is the actual launch stage. When you speed that planter up, the seed runs a risk, especially in a rough environment, of bouncing back into the meter housing. So that's stage one. Stage two is in rough environments or higher speeds, your seed will bounce throughout that, that seed tube. And then stage three is you try and go six and a half mile an hour and that seed has so much momentum. When you release that seed, it's gonna roll over in the furrow and you lost all control of that seed at that point. So this is a really good visual, but the left hand side, this is actually a planter that's traveling seven hundredths of a second. That's how long that seed stayed in the seed tube and it's traveling seven inches. On the right hand side, it just goes to show you if your seed is bouncing in that seed tube, essentially at the end of the day, in this scenario, that planter traveled 11 inches and you had a four inch gap of where the seed should have been versus where you put it because you let that seed bounce in your seed tube. So what does that cost you in yield in the actual field itself? The left hand side, this is a demonstration of what it should look like when your seeds are coming off your meters. And the right hand side is rough, a rough ride scenario. And you can see the seeds coming off in clumps off of that disc. So if you're a guy that plants into rough conditions and that planter is bouncing around throughout the field, very likely that this is the scenario that you're encountering off of your meter. So the, the next area that we look at is population. So swath control and population control throughout the field. This is a quick study that, that Kansas State University did a couple years ago, and they're essentially looking at, based on the size and the shape of your fields, what percentage of your field are you overlapping in, in population control? You can see here, if you're on a pivot, you've got a 60-foot planter, about 4% of your field, you're overlapping if you don't have clutch control. So our solution to the spacing and drive issues on your planter is V-Drive. So as that meter goes around, that V-Drive system is on that planter. But essentially, it's a 12-volt motor that fits up to this V-set meter. And what we would do is strip your entire drive system off. So if you're a guy that has spacing issues or, you know, you have mechanical issues or worn components on your planter, we'll completely take off all your bushings and bearings and hex shafts of your drive system, take off all those areas that you struggle with with maintenance, and the V-Drive will actually control your drive system at that point. So I don't know if you guys actually looked at these little discs when they went around, but these teeth are what's driving the gears on that 12-volt motor. Um, we can get away, as I said, with that 12-volt because the meter is much smaller. I think Kinsey is 24-volt. And then you go to Deer Exact Emerge, and it's actually, the meters are so big, it takes them 56 volts to turn those larger meters. So because it's a much smaller meter, we can get away with less power for um, controlling that specific meter. So you can see here the components that we would take off of your row units versus what would then drive your actual VSET V-Drive system. Did you want to touch on anything? Does anyone in here have VSET V-Drive? Okay. How was your, was this your first year running V-Drive or? Yeah. Your guys' too? How did it go? It's yeah, less maintenance issues. A lot, less. <laughs> a lot less, yeah. What about you guys in the back? Well, I should have said center. I'm saying back because you're behind them. Yeah, you guys. <laughs> How was V-Drive? Was it your second year running V-Drive or? Third year? How many acres have you covered before you had issues with maintenance on the drives and the meters and stuff? Before you changed out a motor or anything? Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. And you guys did cotton and corn with V-Drive? Well, okay. And even with that, the only thing you really ended up having to go in and do at that point was your bearings. We've gone through, out of 100 V-Drives, we've gone through maybe five over that period and actually had to replace either uh, the, the gearbox or the encoder on it for the most part. So. Okay. So any other questions on V-Drive? Okay. The one thing we should say on that is that opens up the V-Set meter to be able to go on to about any make and model or color of planter and such. So when paired with that, then it's a, a full spectrum solution. Correct. Yep. Yep. 
So we'll go through one more area of planting and then we'll give you guys a break because some of you guys are looking at me like you might need one. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to planting, we realize that we're not the Midwest, okay? We know that we don't have the extremely small, narrow planting windows like they do out there. But having said that, every area, you know, in every state has an optimal planting window. And you guys are all shooting for that optimal planting window to ensure that you get the moisture you need in the furrow, the correct temperatures, and you can get that seed in the ground when you know it's gonna produce the highest potential for you, okay? But oftentimes, this is what occurs. So you go out, you plant 240 acres, you get rained out. You wait a few days, you come back, you plant a few more acres, you get rained out, okay? Then you wait, you know, seven days and you come back and you finish your crop. Well, the issue with this is the latter portion of your 440 acres is not in your optimal time frame. So what can we do to push you and push all your acres to where you can produce the maximum potential in that optimal time frame? So speed tube is actually a product that we came out with. It has multiple um, benefits for the actual planter itself. So speed tube itself is essentially plucking the seed off of the V-set disc with these little feeder wheels. It's gonna pluck that seed off before the vacuum shuts off. And we're gonna place that seed into a cupped flight and carry it all the way down into the furrow. So if you had issues with rough ride and, and spacing issues throughout the field, the speed tube will control against some of those issues that you were seeing. I would say a lot of guys, you know, in this area um, have heavy residue and speed tube placing the seed a little bit further into the furrow has alleviated some of the risk of the residue actually pushing your seed before you can place it into the furrow itself. Um, a lot of guys with speed tube you know, they're not looking to go 10 mile an hour in their field environments because you can't in some scenarios if you're going to hit pivot tracks and so forth. But what could speed tube do for you if you could take your current operation and rather than going five mile an hour, you could go seven or you could even possibly go eight. How many acres could you cover an hour more in that environment? So here on the left is a 16 row planner, 1770 and T. Average speed used to be five mile an hour, okay? On a 16 row planter, they could plant roughly 17 acres an hour. If they upgraded to a larger planter and they went to a 24 row, at five mile an hour, they could cover about 25 acres and increase their acres per hour about 50%, okay? If they took their current 16 row and they put on speed tube and they increased their speed, from five to eight mile an hour, at that point, they could cover 27 acres an hour and increase their acres per hour about 60%. So I show this to you to say, I mean, a lot of guys take on more land and they think, you know, we got more land, we gotta go out and buy a bigger planter. But a lot of guys are also not comfortable with having to hire another operator, having to fill another planter, and having to service another machine during the season. So if you could take your current machine and make that machine plant faster, how much more efficient could you be in your operation at that point? And some, some things to think about within our environment. With, we normally don't get that much spring rain. So when we look at corn, there's not necessarily an, a yield advantage of getting in the ground faster, but we come to cotton. How important is it to get that crop in the ground in a narrow window? I've heard some guys say that if it takes us 12 days to plant versus seven days, that's costing us $400 an acre in reduced yield in the current, current lint market. So we start thinking through those situations. There's different places for it. It's not a tool for everyone, but there are certain cases where there is an agronomic advantage of tying things up. Hey, Hans, where you're planting that cotton so darn shallow, does that speed tube work good on that cotton? It, it will maintain control of the seed. The thing that we have to be very careful of as we come back to the previous conversation and downforce management, when we're running both shallow and faster, you cannot run this without automated row by row downforce control because we will mess everything up. So it is a tool in the toolbox, but you have to have other tools there. Say if you're working on a hydraulic hose, you need that 11 16 to hold the base hose before you took the tip off. That's the exact situation we're running into here is we have to have those other control products in order to maintain that uniformity of depth so that we can actually deliver that seed to the trench. Yeah, I would say, I mean, in the 10 states that 
that you know I've had growers in, I have one guy in extremely, extremely beach sand that ran speed tube with Air Force. He's the only guy. And I mean, it was really, really sandy. But everyone else that has ran speed tube, you know, you have to have the high speed meter, which is essentially V set. And then um, the delta force can control your weight management. Because the minute, like we said earlier, the minute you speed up, if that is what you end up doing, is speeding up with it, then your planner is going to require more weight to actually get it to the depth that you need. So that is something else to think through. And some other things to think through is it, the, the flutes on that belt, it does allow us to maximize the control of it, but if you're driving the correct speed for the regular seed tube that's on there, you can actually get better spacing, but you have to be very, very careful of managing your speed. This opens it up so that we can be able to do more. We was up in text line this past spring, open that thing up to 10 miles an hour with that on there and comparing it to the stock planner with E sets next to it going five mile an hour, that was leaving $40 an acre on the table. We cut it down to $20 an acre on the table and we was going double the speed. So when you get stuff dialed in there, there's opportunity, but once again, is it necessarily needing corn? Most likely not. Most guys have too large of a planter for most of their acres already. So as of right now, you cannot. So what you would end up doing, it's corn, cotton, and beans. Um, so with sorghum, milo, that's usually the number one question because most of my territory guys have sorghum too, or milo. And in that scenario, you would just simply pop off the seed tube or the speed tube, put your OEM seed tube back in, takes a couple of minutes a row, and, and then. Now, if you're running larger milo, we have seen guys successfully run a large sugar beet through speed tube and do that well. So if you have control over your milo seed selection, it's a great opportunity. If you're doing seed production, stay away from it because you got so much variability in seed size. All right, so with that, we'll give you guys a 10, 15 minute break or so, and then we'll come back in here and we're gonna go through a lot on fertility control and so forth when we get back, so. The next section that we're gonna go through um, is directly related to fertility application. So on the planter, on a strip till rig, on a side dress rig, on your different applications and passes throughout your farm. And it's all directly related to applying and having uniform access to food, regardless of the crop that you're planting. So who in here actually runs a starter? Show of hands. Okay, so a good portion of you guys. All right, so the intention of a starter is we need to have the right source, we have to apply the right rate so we're not over or under applying. We wanna apply it and have the plant be able to uptake that nutrient at the right time and we have to apply the nutrients because usually starters immobile. So you have to have the nutrients applied at the right place so that the roots actually intercept and have that nutrient to um, root interception time frame. So as a company, we know there's a time period, you know, in, in the process of, of fertility uptake where oftentimes plants are deficient out in the field. So there's a period essentially of hidden hunger. Who has ever walked out to their fields, let's say at V6, V4 to V6, and your crop, your corn crop starts to like yellow a little bit? Have you guys ever seen that? Okay, so oftentimes it's a sign of deficiency, and at that time period, in the early crop stages, that plant, that corn plant, is actually handing off the responsibility of utilizing the nutrients in the seed, and it's handing that off to the root system. So if at that time period it can't find nutrients and it's setting its potential on that ear, we run the risk of losing potential. So we have to ensure that we don't ever stress that plant and we don't run the risk of getting into that time frame of hidden hunger where that, that plant is yellow and deficient. So is this corn hungry? You got a 50-50 shot of getting this answer right. It's either yes or no. <laughs> yes, yeah, corn, that's what everyone says. Corn's always hungry, okay? <laughs> So the answer is yes, right? But it's hard to know unless you have a side-by-side. -side. So when we think about fertility and current systems in the marketplace, we like to think that a CompuTrack in the past is similar to a red ball system. What does a CompuTrack tell you? Yes or no, if you've got seed or you don't, right? That's pretty much it. And a red ball system, as you're looking at it, it's pretty much telling you the same information. You truly don't know what you're applying on a row-to-row -row basis on a red ball system. Would you guys all agree? Okay. So this is actually a grower that came up to our head of engineering two years ago at our winter conference event. And he said, you know, Justin, last year I really struggled with my fertility system. So this year I put GoPros 
on my Red Bull system, and I watched my fertility in the cab. So he knew he had a problem the year before, and he was determined not to have the same issue the next year, okay? Well, what happened as he watched his 2,000 acres is he thought he did a good job until he started scouting. Well, when he started scouting, he noticed these yellow blocks throughout his field. Well, he got a little piece of bag in his inlet pump in his fertility system, and he didn't know. And he was watching for it. Well, the problem is he was applying five gallons of starter and, and you know, 31 gallons of 28%, so a good amount of his fertility. And in that scenario, in these yellowed areas, he lost 15 bushel at $3 corn across 1,690 acres. That little piece of bag cost him nearly $75,000, $76,000 that year. So do you truly know on your different fertility systems what's actually happening out in the field? So we came out with a product called FlowSense. And FlowSense essentially is a measurement device that you can put on every single row on your current liquid system, okay? So you do have to run the 2020 because we have to be able to show you the information. Um, but in this environment, you would truly know what you're outputting. So I don't know how you guys have your pump system set up today, but if you mount your pump on one side of that, that planner or the other, it makes a difference on your output supply. In this scenario, this guy mounted his pump system on the far right side of that planner, and then he ran his lines to the left-hand side of the planner. Well, on the right-hand side of the planner, he was completely over-applying. You can see here he's at 40 gallons. The center of the planner, he's good, but the left-hand side of the planner, he's only at about 30 gallons. So on this specific scenario, he had a 27% row-to-row -row variability. So you guys are, are, you know, you've been in the industry for a while, you realize that when it comes to singulation, you have to have above, you know, 98% singulation, that's good. So if I told you today, hey, we're gonna send you out to the field with your meters, and you're gonna have 27% variability on your meters, would you go to the field and plant? No, right? Too much variability. The same thing is happening on your fertility systems, on your strip till rigs, and your side dress rigs, and your planter, but you can't see it. So I'll pass these two little flow sense around, but flow sense is, is really giving you the information that you need on a row by row basis. It's a direct replacement for a red ball system. So in addition to that, another struggle is you guys are orifice for a specific speed. So if you put an operator in the cab and you say, don't go over five mile an hour, I'm gonna set this planner, and he chooses to go six or six and a half, and he gets outside your zone, you run an issue of having variable application rate on that operation pass. You can see here, if he goes from three mile per hour to five, his application rate is falling off. So in addition to that, I don't know if any of you guys actually have a piston pump, but if you do or you're looking toward it in the future, I want you to remember this. In a piston pump, it's sending pulses and they're propagating all the way out to the wings on every row. So with the piston pump, you're essentially creating a hidden hunger environment in your, on your plan or across your field. So you're over applying, under applying, over applying, under applying. So in this scenario, this is a really good visual, but you can see here on that planner, he's going from nine gallons to 1.1 gallon because of that piston. Okay, so we have to be able to control against this. So with liquid control systems in general, they have poor monitoring, they have a very small flow range, and it has uneven distribution. So the fertility hardware is also very cumbersome. It takes a lot of fertility, and everyone's fertility system seems to be different. I mean, you call Doltmeyer or these other companies, and you really truly have to know what you're asking for because you need to set it up yourself. There's no you know, exactly right and exactly wrong way to set up your specific fertility system. So we came out with a product a couple years ago called V-Apply. And V-Apply essentially is an on-the-row liquid control system. So essentially we would take control of, you know, a lot of the pumps that you currently have on your strip till rig, your side dress, your planter. So hydraulically controlled centrifugal pumps, piston, electric pumps, and at this point, this little module on every row is going to control 
your flow, and it's also going to have you know, swath control um, for application rate, auto flow balancing, and within this actual module, um, there's essentially a flow sense built in. So we know on every row how much you're outputting and the rates that you're, you're actually applying. So the way vApply works is there's a total flow turbine and the liquid would come in to the actual module itself. And if it is below a specific rate, it stays within the low flow turbine. Once you get above a specific rate, it opens up the high flow chamber and sends liquid through the high flow um, turbine that's within the actual module. There's a 12 volt motor within the vApply module itself that's controlling a ball valve on the top of the apply module. So we're saying, okay, you're trying to apply 10 gallons and this ball valve is going to open proportionally to the amount of liquid you're trying to apply on that specific row. So at this point, you truly have control over what you're applying and you know what your actual application rate is on that system. So in general, Hans, you want to talk through the pressure what was applications? The, what was the question? How much supply of pressure? You need, I think, under about 100, under 100 PSI is your max. Yeah, so but. the system can handle up to 100 PSI. The, basically, the, the plumbing of the system is we're going to spin whatever pump you have at 110% of what your applied rate is based upon that speed. We turn the planter into a wet boom. And so we have a, a properly sized manifold across there to ensure we're running less than a 15 PSI pressure drop between your pump and the row. And then from there, then the module has both um, uh, a built-in flow meter. And so we're on the row making those adjustments to handle what's going on. Now, the one thing is this is a very, very accurate system. So wettable powders are not compatible with this system. They'll get in, they'll gum stuff up. Um, and such there does, as long as you're running a, a truly in suspension product um, and it can clear an 80 mesh screen, um, we're able to control that at a very high level of accuracy. Is that going to do your side by side and your end your row? So we, we, can, we can actually stack up to four of these on a planner if you have up to four different products. Um, okay, well, what if you're going to run the same product that's going to run side by side and your end your yep. row? Yep, so w what we're going to do is, and once we get into conceal here a little bit later on, but we got guys that are running five placements of fertilizer, we'll take one V-apply pump, and then being the system is clean, we will go ahead and use orifices on, within the row to divide up that flow within those five locations. It's going to ensure on the row as a whole, we're going to have the correct amount, and then being as we've cleared that 80 mesh screen, your likelihood of having too small of an orifice is very low, so we're not going to have any risk of contaminating it. And then we're, we're looking at a very short distance of only a couple of inches around those orifices in order to provide that distribution within those five points in a, in a multi-point system. So if you think through it, as it shows here, I mean, you can do three gallons per acre at three mile an hour, so on a planter, I mean, that would be your low side rate, and take the same exact module. There's a flex module, so essentially the flex module is flexible amongst your passes. So you technically could take the same exact flex module, take it off your planter, and go and put it on your side dress rig, and take that same, same exact module and go and put it on your strip till rig. So it helps you spread and allocate the cost of being able to actually move that modular the apply module to another application. As well as for, if a guy's running wide drop on the sprayer, we can move this module to the sprayer so we can get a very accurate row level control so that we're maintaining that, that eliminating that artificial hidden hunger due to our misapplication. We're able to control it and, right. and ensure that we're doing exactly what you need to be done. And I would say on a planter, you can do section control. So you do have the ability to, like Han said, you can run one module, and I would say the high limit is up to four rows underneath that one module. Essentially, at that point, if you did section, every row would have a check valve and an orifice, as he mentioned, underneath that one module. So technically, you have a 16 row, you could have you know, four V-apply modules across that planter. But once you go to a side dress rig, like last week I, when I was presenting in Texas, a lot of those guys are trying to apply 50 to 55 gallons on a, uh, I'm sorry, on a strip till rig. And in those scenarios, if you're trying to strip at a higher rate, you truly do need a module on every row because we have to be able to supply the correct amount of gallons underneath that row. So whether you're sectioned or row to row depends on your flow output. I mean, we just have to make sure we can push enough flow through. And, and the level of resolution of control. Right. Someone else have a question over here? Okay. 
Any other questions on VApply? So, something else we should address here is you'll see on that map, you see there's different rates being applied. Being as we have that, that high level of resolution of control, this opens up the door that we can now have per row resolution control of fertilizer rates. We start getting into some of the other monitoring tools. We, we can be able to tune things up and depending upon how much variability there is on the farm or within the field, I should say, we can be able to get that correct rate of fertilizer in the correct location in that field and be able to maybe reallocate and not spend any more on fertilizer, but put it where it needs to be in the field at a very high level of accuracy. So, and as you guys are passing around that flow sense, the one that is dual barrel is essentially, yeah, you're being able, you're able to read two products. Like today, if you're running a pop-up in a two by two, we could read your flow application on the row for each of those. So you would have like a high for the two by two and a low for the, the pop-up, but that's the difference between those two. Okay, so the next area that we look at is the true hardware application of your fertility. So this portion is the control, and this is what's actually engaging the soil and the hardware portion. So FurrowJet is a product that we released um, a couple years ago. This essentially is an in-furrow micronutrient placement tool. So with FurrowJet, you can see where it's attaching on the actual planter. There's one on this row unit behind me. But our intention is to supply a pop-up and a near seed application for micronutrients. So you can see here, <clears throat> FurrowJet essentially runs in the furrow. The seed firmer is going to firm the seed. And then this tool, <clears throat> this tungsten carbide um, manifold here, is going to supply an output in either a tri-band, so you can have the same product, increase your rate, uh, you know, around three times is, is the highest rate that I've seen guys increase it, but it kind of depends on your agronomy, you know, scenarios and conditions. Um, or you can split it and do a pop-up and then do a three-quarters of an inch from the seed application. So you have the, the ability to kind of determine what you want to actually apply here. There's a lot of guys that I have down south of here, you know, Lubbock and La Mesa, that are actually applying a liquid insecticide in cotton because it's getting them nearer than they could have been in the past. Um, and it truly gives them a better root zone protection with the three quarters of an inch from the seed itself. <clears throat> so with that, I'll pass for a gentleman. You wanna? So some other things to keep in mind in regards to kind of the rate side of the conversation. When we look at phosphorus removal in corn, we, if you put down, say, 15 gallons of a, a 1034-0 with black label or some combination of that, with a 15-gallon rate, you're going to be covering removal of up to about 220 bushels worth of phosphorus and such. So we're able to get it down there, get it banded. When you think of phosphorus in a broadcast versus a banding application, we can be able to get one and a half times the efficiency when phosphorus is banded in these higher uh, pH soils because the calcium isn't tying it up. As far as kind of on the burn side, we've turned this up to 35 gallons in a tri-band. On some sand over by Sedan, um, going in, we ran from 10 to 30 gallons. Between 25 and 30 gallons, we saw 1% burn in loss of plant stand. And then 30 to 35, we saw another percent. And the pivot on that, we planted it semi-dry pivot came around within three days, so it wasn't exposed very long. Now we go over another couple miles, the pivot didn't get turned on for a week, and at 15 gallons we lost about 9% of the plants. But go to a dry land right next to it at 10 gallons, we didn't lose anything and it sat there for three weeks. So depending upon how soon you have moisture coming into it, how high your sand is, is going to kind of determine where those, those safe thresholds are in that environment as far as a rate goes. Does anyone have any other questions on FurrowJet? Go ahead. You asked me this last year, I think. I don't, um, not yet, not yet. I mean, the technology is there, it's just not unlocked yet, <laughs> I would say, yeah. Yeah, because essentially it's just, you know, a software control at that point, because you have the physical hardware there, yeah. So as Hans mentioned, I mean, you know, you have about the 1.5 um, efficiency of your banding control, and essentially it's uh, like an IV to the plant. So like I mentioned, you're going to feed the plant with your pop-up, you're going to hand it off to your three-quarters of an inch, and then from there you're going to hand it off into your nitrogen application. 
So this is a quick video that will give you a, a better visual on how it's actually applying the liquid in the furrow. And it attaches to what we call a quick attach Keaton. You can see the quick attach is right here. If you're run, this is actually speed tube. So if you're running speed tube, you would already have the quick attach on your planner. You'd pop that furrow jet in, and then as it glides through the furrow, you can see it's actually cutting in three quarters of an inch from the seat itself. And there was actually a guy, he did it on his own, we didn't know until after he was done, but there's a guy from Iowa that came to one of our events, um, which is called, you know, Pontiac Farms in, in Illinois, and he told us that last year he ran furrow jet, he ran it dry, he didn't even apply a, a fertility through it, because he had really compactable soils and he wanted to break up the furrow sidewall, and so he ran it on half of his rows compared to the other half, and he actually saw a four bushel advantage on the half of the rows that had furrow jet, just because those wings were breaking up the compactable furrow sidewall and he had a better furrow that he was creating from it. So uh, just another advantage that, you know, a grower has seen in this environment. But. So that's a mobilized nutrient application. And then we move into nitrogen application. So we also have a product that I was just speaking to some of you about called Conceal. This is a product that we just released this year and it's, it's solely for nitrogen. So essentially, and maybe Hans, you want to talk through it since it's over there on the row unit. Yeah, so, so basically what we're doing is we're coming in with a new gauge wheel and t be able to tuck a knife into the gauge wheel so residue is an issue. It'll get sucked through the gauge wheel. But what it allows is we're three and a half inches either side of the seed and we're an inch below the surface. So we're eliminating the risk of volatization of any nitrogen or um, other nutrients that are more leachable and whatnot, putting them on the surface and allowing them to get tied up in the residue. We can get it below the surface so that it's safe. And then when looking at the, the placement over there, we have the opportunity of up to five bands of placement, which when you start getting into this, we can look at it from a safeness standpoint, is we can now turn that in for a rate down to what does that plant actually need to be able to hand off to the three quarter inch band? And then what does it need to be able to hand off out to that three inch band? And so maybe we can cut in furrow down to maybe now a gallon and a half and then the tri-band or the, the wings, be able to cut that down to five gallons, and then be able to put the balance of your, your uh, liquid program out through there so you have a safer environment as well as everything's stable and below the surface, and we can be able to put out, say in a no-till environment, put out all of your phosphorus right around the plant in a completely safe environment to meet removal and be as absolutely efficient as possible. So as Hans mentioned, Conceal truly is for just nitrogen, and obviously the, the high side of our Conceal application is 60 gallons. A lot of guys always ask, well, you can do single or dual banded application. I would say if you're gonna go over 30 gallons of nitrogen on the planter, that is the point at which you would go to a dual band. If you're only gonna, if you're gonna stay under 30 gallons, you know, you can stay under 30 gallons and, and just have a single band. You, you, you could get, band yeah, you, you can technically you could get by with a single band. You start thinking about it. If we're putting all the nutrient on one side of the plant, where are all the roots for that plant? Are they only on that one side or are they on both sides? So we start looking at how do we in, be able to improve the availability of stuff and how do we make that plant work less? So you look at furrow jet where we're putting evenly on both sides and so there is an agronomic advantage of having a knife on both sides so they'd be able to keep that plant as balanced as possible and, and accessible to those nutrients. Any questions on conceal? Okay. So the last area that we look at is visualization of uniformity. So essentially, if we're going to control against all these areas, we have to visually see what's occurring out in the field. So this is a, a picture from a planner that I took a couple years ago, and, and um, in this scenario, I was riding on a guy's planner in Central Texas, and we were talking through his fertility system, and he said that he had a he had a red ball system monitoring his fertility. So I turned around and looked out the back window, and didn't see anything. <coughs> and I thought, well, where is your monitoring system? He's like, well, I mounted it behind that tank because it didn't tell me anything, anyways. So <laughs> the idea behind this is. If you're going to have control or try and have control, you have to be able to visually know what's occurring in your calf to control what's occurring on the back of that planter. 
So we always think of it in medical terms, and it wasn't, you know, a few years ago that your grandparents probably went to the doctor, and maybe they had a complex heart issue, and the only thing diagnosing their complex heart issue was a stethoscope. That was it. You couldn't really see what was under the surface and what was actually occurring in, in you know, in their bodies. And now, we like to think of it in the same way as a Dickie John monitor. That's kind of like a stethoscope. Told you if you were planting or if you weren't, and that's pretty much it. So now with medicine, you have visual imaging that can truly give you an idea of what's actually occurring below the surface so you can make a decision on how to approach the issue that that, you know, that um, person has that has come to the clinic. So we believe that that technology has come into agriculture. In our eyes, the same type of visual imaging is provided by the 2020 um, seed sense. So this is what our prior 2020 looks like, and it's still a great monitor usable for most of our products. This is the newest version of our 2020. It actually has high definition mapping built within the Gen 3 monitor. Does anyone in here today have the Gen 3 2020? Okay. So a 2020 in general, if, if some of you guys have not been around it, is essentially like a stoplight. Green's good, yellow's pay attention, if something shows red, you really need to stop and get out of the cab and do something about that metric. So these are the, the high level um, metrics on the monitor itself. We're gonna show population. We're gonna show SRI. It's kind of like your COV on a deer monitor, okay? How much variability do you have row to row? If you have starter, that's gonna populate to the home screen. Singulation is truly how are your meters performing. And then downforce, in my opinion, is probably the most important metric, but this is telling you whether or not you're actually getting the ground contact that you're trying to achieve, okay? Once we have gotten our ground contact, at that point we will show you that you have extra weight, and that's essentially your margin. And so, something to keep in mind with that metric as you're rolling through the field, the, the, those high and low rows at the bottom, those are a one second average of what's going on versus that ground contact, we're looking 200 times per second. Do we have weight on those gauge wheels? And if we don't, it's gonna start messing with that number. And then the margin above it, that's the padding that you have on top of reaching depth. Um, depending upon conditions, sometimes we can be running, say, 50, 60 pounds of margin and still 98% ground contact just due to the grounds changing so much underneath. So we always want to control to that 100% ground contact. That's going to eliminate that loss of ground contact, which is our most costly um, error in there. And then we're going to start controlling to the top end because, yes, if we compact that soil too much in a clay environment, we can limit yield in sand. Not as big of a deal. So a couple other metrics that you essentially could pull to the home screen. We're going to speak to some of these in a bit with a different tool that we have that runs in furrow. Um, but this is all level one. So level two is every single row for that specific metric. So this is population. You can see every row and how that row is truly performing for that specific metric. So the third level is every metric for that row. So if you think you have an issue, a lot of guys on this level of the screen get a little piece of bag caught in their meter or a little piece of string from their bag. And at that point, you'll pick it up, you know, usually on this third level of, of, of uh, planner information. But essentially on the bottom here, all of these uh, dots are good spaced plants or good spaced and, and singulated plants. And essentially, if you saw a red one go across the screen, that's a skip and the blues are multiples. So if you thought you had repetition, you could stop your planner and go back and dig at eight feet and prove it to yourself that you truly have an issue coming off that monitor. So there's also seeding summaries, so you know overall how you're doing. There's a population average on what your average output is in population. Your singulation, how are your meters performing planter-wide on average? And then obviously your skips and doubles as well. So the same thing as far as downforce, this is a very important screen. So on your planter, you could see every single row if you had a weigh pin on every single row. And at that point, you would truly know what percent is your ground contact across your entire planter you know, for that area in the field. And then your ride quality as well. Another one of, I would say, one, you know, one of the more important areas of the, the Gen 3 monitor is the diagnostics in general. 
So there's no symbols and so forth that you're trying to have to determine what they are. This truly leads you to exactly where the problem is. So if you click to the diagnostic screen and you think you have an issue with delta force, this delta force cylinder is going to be red. You're going to click on the delta force cylinder and it's going to lead you to where the, the diagnostics are for that specific area and that row um, of the planter itself. So, so the thing to think about is you look at your deer monitor. If something goes wrong with it, you have to end up calling deer to come out and fix it. Here, you have all the exact same information that we have to be able to support you. So most of the time, we can be able to support you over the phone so that you're only down for maybe four or five minutes if something goes wrong because you have all the same information we do. And we'll be doing some other training as we get closer to planning to be able to equip guys with the tools that they need to be able to keep that machine in the field so you're not waiting a day, day and a half for a tech to get out there and resolve it. And then on the flip side, if something does go wrong, we're going to figure out every way we can to be out there within an hour to keep you in the field. So as I mentioned on the Gen 3 monitor, you do have high definition mapping as you plant throughout the field. You also have the ability to run a field view map with the 2020 or the Gen 3 monitor if you choose. Um, this is, <laughs> there's a specific reason why I show this map in, and it's to prove that when you have a visual map, you can truly find issues in the field. So I'm gonna ask you guys this, and hopefully someone responds because I have more hats, but this is a guy that was gonna go out and plant 8,000 acres with this planter, okay? Half of this planter, you can see, has blue rows. Half that planter was floating, losing ground contact. The other half that planter was compacting. What do you think happened? Gauge wheel. Who said gauge wheel? What happened with the gauge wheel? Uh, one was probably higher than the other. On the whole side of the planter? Yeah. Okay, maybe. Anyone else? <laughs> it's not 100%. What'd you say? You want the half? <laughs> Who else said something? Down pressure. Okay, what's wrong with it? What do you think mechanically would be causing this? Central fill. Okay. Anyone else? Pass this back to him. So the, yeah, this is actually a downforce map. So I guess if his tank was mounted on the side, it could look like it's compacting. So this specific planter, I'm running out of hat, so I'll just give you guys the answer. <laughs> this, this specific planter um, was one planter of two in that operation. So this guy was actually gonna go out and plant 16,000 acres with two planters, okay? So they had two operators. So the issue was both operators were setting the depth setting for this planter and then both operators were setting the depth setting for the other planner. So what happened was one of the operators set the right-hand side eight rows, and the other operator set the left-hand side eight rows. One set them too shallow, one set them too deep. The problem here is that this guy did one field, and his tech running the, the machine was smart enough to call the, the precision planning dealer, and this was actually over east of Sunray, and he called the dealer, and he said, hey, I have an issue, I'm not planning any more of our fields until you get out here and look at this planter. Because instantly on his map, he knew there was a problem. So the issue here is that this same planter would have overcompacted eight rows and floated the other eight on 8,000 acres across their farm. So my point to you is, you have to have the information in the cab. If you don't have high definition mapping in the cab, it is very, very difficult to give yourself a planter report card to truly know what's occurring on that planter. So these maps are, are extremely valuable so you can make a change so it doesn't affect the rest of your 2,000, 8,000 acres, whatever it may be that you're gonna plant with that specific planter. So the, the, the very last thing that we're gonna look into is moisture control. So, a lot of you go out to the field and you're checking your depth settings and you're trying to truly put your seed in moisture. And you can see here, let's assume we're set for two inches. Even if you're set for two inches, your moisture line changes throughout the field. And if you're not a grower that has unlimited water and you can't just water up your crop the next day, then this becomes something that we have to control against, okay? So I pulled this map from May 
of this year. In May of this year, we were in a fairly bad drought in most of the Southwest. And in this scenario, moisture becomes even more of an issue, especially in a drought environment. So we created a product called Smart Firmer. And Smart Firmer essentially is, is like a Keaton seed firmer in that it runs along in the furrow and it's an infrared spectrometer and it's truly giving you accurate readings in the furrow itself of different metrics that are sent up to the 2020 monitor. So what you would see in the cab with this sensor is uniform furrow. So how much uniformity do you have throughout your furrow itself? You would see furrow moisture, so in corn in specific, uh, corn seed essentially has to absorb a, a percentage of its weight in moisture to germ. So furrow moisture is telling us that that corn seed has enough moisture that it will imbibe the seed and germ within a three-day time period. Temperature, it's providing real-time temperature in the field, so you know, you know if you're going to pull out and water that crop up, your water is obviously going to cool your crop down. So is your, is your soil temperature too cool currently that we're going to run into issues when we apply water to it? So this is what it would look like essentially in the field with variable moisture. This guy ran in, I believe he was in Iowa or Illinois, but either way, it doesn't really matter. So in this specific field, you can see an area of his field where he had 45% for a moisture and he had plenty of moisture to imbibe that seed and germinate and he has consistent emergence. Okay? If you're in an, a drier environment and you only have 10% furrow moisture, you can quickly see that we're not imbibing the seed and germing at the same rate because of the inconsistent soil moisture and we have uneven emergence. So there's another good visual. You can see an area of this field that has good moisture versus an area that does not. And in the area of poor moisture, we had 5% more LE1s and 4% more LE2s. And in general, we lost nine bushel in that area of the field because we were too dry. We put that seed in a dry environment. So wh while we're still talking on moisture, with pivots, we think we're, we're protecting that seed by having that moisture available. Two years ago, we was trying to do a fertility study with FurrowJet. We ended up finding the results back in regards to furrow moisture. Looking back at it, we had gone in, this was early June, going into some wheat stubble, and when it planted half the field, immediately started the pivot on a four-day loop. And as it's working around, they went and planted the other half. The half that had water to it, it was planted and had water on it within three hours. We had $7 an acre left on the table of all the errors that we could find behind that planter. We go to the other half where it's three days later that the pivot got to it, $36 an acre left on the table due to uneven emergence. So it was a $29 an acre loss in a 350 corn market because the pivot took three days to get to it. And so this is very important to think this through. Now, it begs the question, do we pre-irrigate? Do we get go, certainly a no-till environment is going to solve a lot of these issues because we have that residue to be able to protect that moisture. So we have to start asking these questions. What do we need to change in order to solve this issue? Because I'm sure all of us could use another 30 bucks an acre in the pocket over what we're currently doing. Well, and I've had a lot of guys too in, um northeastern Colorado that obviously have pivots and they're starting to become more limited in water and they've said that the guys that ran Smart Firmer, it's essentially their gauge now to know, okay, if I'm on limited water, when I pull out of this field, can I wait and not run the pivot right away and save that inch, you know, for a week or two out when you actually need it or a time frame when you need it because you truly know you have enough water or moisture in the field to germ that seed appropriately. So some of those guys in limited allocation are using it more of a tool to know what they can do. Um, with Smart Firmer itself, if you're someone that variable rates uh, based on organic matter, this tool will actually give you an organic matter reading as you're going through the field. So if you pick up new land and you don't have an OM you know, reading on that specific field, this will give you that live reading that you can then control your population to on your planter. So one of the other most important areas of, of Smart Firmer, especially in our area, is clean furrow. 
So how much crop residue are you actually still allowing to fall within your furrow? And what is it costing you? So this is a good visual on clean furrow, but you'll start to see the crop residue is falling within the furrow. And this is the metric that you would visually see on the 2020 in the cab. And when the residue falls in, your clean furrow reading falls off. Well, at that point, if you had clean sweep, you could actually apply a higher PSI to your clean sweep, more weight, and clean a better furrow to ensure that you're moving as much of that residue as you should be to, to keep that um, furrow as clean as it, it needs to be. And the thing to keep in mind is when you have a real-time feedback, it was interesting, we were setting up a planter this past April, had some firmer on it, we was going in and dialing stuff up, had a little bit of residue coming in, so we turned up and ran a higher amount of pressure on that row cleaner and then the value actually went down. We ended up finding that 20 PSI down actually gave us the optimum rather than anecdotally thinking, oh, well, we just need more to clean it better and such there. So this is another good visual. Um, this is actually Messer Farms in, in North Dakota, I believe, but either way, this is an area of the field that has a bad clean furrow versus an area that has good you can see the good clean furrow was at about 98%. The bad was when it fell off to 85%. And they went out and pulled the ears to prove that when you show bad clean furrow, you have a yield loss and you can visually see the ears had pulled back substantially when there was too much residue that fell in. And in that environment on that side by side, it cost them 25 bushel difference from not creating that good clean furrow environment. The other thing to keep in mind is now that we start getting this metric, we're looking at strip till rigs. Simply because you're strip tilling doesn't mean we're solving residue issues. We're actually seeing worse residue in furrow in strip till than a no till machine. Um, we need to spend more time trying to evaluate is there a particular strip till rig that does better than others. Um, but that's a very interesting thing that came out of running this and be able to see, okay, we have a problem. Now we need to go find a solution to it. So any other questions on Smart Firmer? Okay, so with that, um, I would say that a lot of times we get done with these presentations and the first question is, you know, what do I do? <laughs> you kind of gave me a fire hose of information for the last couple of hours and I don't even know where to start. So I always say the best place to start is obviously with the monitor. You have to know what's occurring on your planner. So if you do nothing else this year, have the visual information on your planter to know what's occurring back there. And you can also, you know, set yourself up with FlowSense if you're someone that has a liquid system. FlowSense will tell you whether or not you have issues on your current fertility system. Um, and then after that, in my opinion, it's weight management because we have to get the crop out of the ground with Delta Force and ensure we have a good emergence. So from that, we actually created our own precision planting row unit. You have the ability to, I say it's kind of like a menu, you have the ability to custom choose what you want to put on the row unit and build out your row unit from us in specific. So it just gives you another option. You can retrofit what you guys are currently running. You can use your, your own bar if it's sound and you know, in, in good shape and fit up your bar with new row units with you know, new parts and so forth so you have less wear issues. So what problem will you solve? The only way to truly know what to change in your crop is to get out there and start to look at the agronomy side and to really dig and figure out what's going on below the soil surface. Um, and I always say that you know, running away from a problem only increases the distance from the solution. So if you saw an issue out in your field last year and you were educated on something that was related to the planter this year that you might not have known, um, it's definitely worth reaching out to Hans to see what else can we help you change on your planter. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention before you know, Hans kind of takes over is there's those little cards that are on your, your um, seats. And those little cards are, they have your planter profile, make and information, and the back has different products. If you guys have questions on something directly related to your planner, that's kind of your meal ticket. So make sure you fill those out and then Hans can get back to you on any specifics you guys have. So, so something else thinking back on clean furrow we didn't get to touch on is we started watching what's the impact of a given gauge wheel on cl both cleanliness of furrow and row unit ride. And what we're finding is even with some of the best row cleaners out there, they'll throw material out 
but they'll only throw it out to about an inch short of the edge of the gauge wheel, and so that row ends up starting doing this. So on a number of machines, we've gone to a narrower gauge wheel, which as long as we're not on sand, um, most guys can be able to do. Otherwise, we need delta force because otherwise we're going to have too much weight on that row unit and such. So there's different things we're seeing there that little things along the way. It's, there's no magic bullet, but it's just thinking through methodically of your operation, what's that weakest link? And systematically starting working through that process and whatnot.